Bramitz on the golf course. Nicole Moore is out with thermal and rifle to put a hole in one, two, or three of them. You scared the living daylights out of us and we were getting our golf clubs ready to, <laughs> to attack. Cornish backdrop. Our own Deborah has gone all Hollywood and is making a feature film. She checks out Ian Hodge's shop and playground for a shooting scene. We want to make sure everything in the movie does actually show real life. Plus bass on mass. We're at the Orvis Saltwater Fly Fishing Festival in Chichester Harbour. Competition is for butchery equipment from Highland Outdoors. Robin Shedden from Clooney Country explains the best options for left-handed shooters. Meredith brings you the news on the news stump. And James Marchington has the best hunting and shooting videos in hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. The greenkeepers at this golf course are teed off with rabbits digging up the pristine turf. They've enlisted the help of Nicole Moore, shooting girl with an afro on Instagram. She lives nearby. She's even brought a fancy new night scope to get the job done. OK, all set up. I'm normally here a couple of times a week, um, just doing a handful each time, just to kind of um, keep on top of them for now. But yeah, we'll see. It's a, it's a new permission for me. Um, I call it permission. It is, it is pest control. And I've only been on it a couple of weeks, but every single outing, I've had half a dozen rabbits. So yeah, um, just within a couple of hours. He did a little bit of a run towards the nettles. But if I stick close to the edge, I should be able to get within, I reckon, 40 or 50 yards because there's some trees about that distance from him. So I should be able to tuck myself in, get a bit closer. You can see the damage when you're walking around that they do to the golf course, it's, it's pretty horrendous. I tend to come down just as dusk is settling and then into the night hours. So when I first arrived, the team were really friendly, really lovely. They took me out in the golf buggy and drove me around the whole course. I said I wanted to know where the boundaries were, where the houses were. Um, I'm shooting a 2-2, so, um, you know, that's really important. There's a road nearby, lots of houses around. So I wanted to kind of get a feel for it myself, but also at the same time they were showing me their problem areas. One of the hazards Nicole has to deal with is golfers hanging around after the course has officially closed for the night. It's funny, the first time I came here, there were golfers here two hours after um, the, effectively, the closing time. And someone also walking his dog on the golf course, which I'm sure he's not allowed to do. Um, but I use my thermal, I have my um, pulsar here, um, and it's the same as shooting anywhere. I just always make sure that it's safe. Um, I use the thermal for ranging as well. I can use the scope as a rangefinder. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. <laughs> so um, for now, I'll, I'll use the, the thermal, which is, is fine because I'm using it anyway in terms of finding the heat source and also checking that there's, there's no one else behind. You know, really, really uh, essential to have in terms of safety when you're doing a, a job like this. Um, to one over there, two over there, which is handy. Head that way, if I can get any of them, great. If not, I can tuck in behind those two, three. <laughs> the rifle is a Seiko uh, rimfire. I have a feeling it's about 20 years old. It has always been really reliable. Um, I've always used this for rabbits. And the scope is an ATN Excite day and night scope. And it's, it's definitely been a game changer for me just in terms of being able to stay out longer, stay out in the dark, and ultimately shoot more rabbits. I think I've had it for, I don't know, 10 days, and I absolutely love it. <laughs> I still haven't um, fully played around with all the settings, but the clarity on the scope is like, is crystal clear when I get it right, which makes it easier for me, but also makes it safer. You know, I can take a shot with all the confidence in the world, you know, um, and, you know, ultimately, I am doing this effectively as a job. You know, I am doing it for pest control. I'm not just doing it for, for pleasure and for filling my freezer. So, um, you know, I, I want to make sure that I've got 
um, the best kit that I can to, to get the job done um, in a safe and quick manner. You know, I don't want to be out all night shooting rabbits. I don't want to be spending hours and hours doing it. Um, so if I can get it done in a couple of hours and a kit like this just makes it easier for me, um, brilliant. So it's quite straightforward actually on, on this land. Basically I start at one end and I walk. Tend to find that within 50 to 100 yards, I happen upon the first group of rabbits. I shoot what I can, um, you know, one or two, and then the rest will, will normally run away. I'll wait for 10 to 50 minutes to see if they come back out. If they don't, I walk a little bit further. Again, 50 to 100 yards, I'll find another group and, and repeat basically until I get tired and then I turn around and go back. <laughs> <laughs> the furthest rabbit I've ever shot um, is at 76 yards. I am, in terms of rifle shooting compared to the, the shotgun, I've only been shooting a rifle for maybe five or six years. Um, so to me, I'm not an expert when it comes to the rifle. So I, I'm someone that prefers to just shoot within my comfort zone. You know, so I'd rather if I see a rabbit at 100 yards, I know people that can shoot them at 100 yards and more, um, but that um, I'm not skilled enough to do that. So I'd rather stalk in to 40, 50 yards. Much easier to do under the blanket of night um, at, and with a night scope. So yeah, I don't have, to, don't have to worry about it so much. The first time when I came to the clubhouse to meet the manager and, and the other, the green keepers, there were, several dozen um, golfers in there and they all knew what I was there for and they all kind of came up and had a chat and, and weren't, they weren't bothered at all. You know, ultimately I'm, I'm helping them to have a better game um, and not be tripping over, you know, bad ground that the, the rabbits have disturbed and, and destroyed. And they're all very curious, made a few jokes about rabbit pies and things like that. <laughs> um, yeah, so far so good. Um, anyone that's kind of seen me whilst I've been out on the course has just left me to it. And so far, no complaints to the manager, as far as I'm aware. Um, the only thing that did happen a few nights ago was that there were golfers here with the floodlights on way after they were supposed to be here. And in the distance, they just saw my torch as I was heading back to the car with my feet illuminating across the, uh, the golf course. They probably thought there was a ghost or something. They did say, you scared the living daylights out of us and we were getting our, our um, golf clubs ready to... <laughs> <laughs> to attack um, but no otherwise you know I've, I've had no issues so far and, and like I say ultimately I'm here for their benefit so <sighs> six Saturday night four Monday night and three tonight 13 so yeah unlucky for some not for the golf club <laughs> <laughs> I am someone that eats anything that I shoot so um, yeah I had in fact I had rabbit paella for lunch um, and there are a couple of green keepers who have asked for some rabbit themselves. So, you know, if I'm here on a day when they're here closing up, um, I will give a couple to them, which is, is lovely. I love that other people are, are eating this, this meat and it's not going to waste. Didn't see as many rabbits tonight as I have done in, in, in previous trips, but all three shots were instant kills, which is, is always the main thing for me anyway, no matter what game I'm shooting. And yeah, I've got three more rabbits for the pot. You can follow Nicole on Instagram, link below. Thanks, Nicole. Now we gave away a dummy skirt from Muntjac Trading to Michael Ritchie. This week's competition is for two deer butchery sets from Smith's Edge Sport range, kindly donated by Highland Outdoors and together prices around hundred pounds. Links to them below. We're still fundraising for our day in court with Chris Packham. Here is David to talk about our Poke Packham auction page. Hi, I just wanted to let you know about the incredible range of auction prizes Field Sports Channel is offering thanks to our amazing friends and partners. It's all part of a fundraising effort to cover the super expensive legal costs of just staying in the ring with Mr Packham. He has television money and we have you. One of the most extraordinary shows of support has come from one of our friends, Nico Els from East Cape Bushveld Hunting, is offering a trip to the Eastern Cape where Paul Childley and I spent a fantastic week hunting kudu, bushbuck and other plains game. What a place and what an outfitter. If you want to hunt and learn, there's no one better. Closer to home, Mr Childley and Mr Crow are offering pegs on shoots and seats in hides. There's Elevens' gin, artwork, 
a day at the races plus a Browning semi-auto, a Merkel one-off and stalking in Ireland. Please head to our website fieldsportschannel.tv and click on the wolf to see the amazing range of hunting, shooting and fishing opportunities. To poke Packham you have to hunt, shoot and fish. Thanks David and of course that auction ends on Sunday night this Sunday so please get your bids in by then. And he's not available for me to be rude about him this week, he's away. Instead here is Meredith on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. You are watching Field Sports Channel News. Two Australian deer hunters dodged gunfire when a government culling helicopter flew into their airspace. The two men were legally hunting on private land in South Australia when an aircraft flew over shooting at a herd of animals. They filmed on their phones as the helicopter passed overhead within rifle range. They say complaints to police at the time were ignored. Now local hunter Jake Nicholson has taken up the case, which is to be raised in the Australian Parliament. If the roles were reversed, if the hunters were in a location where they had no permission to be and were you know, using firearms and hunting or any sort of um, activity, you would fall, uh, you know, brunt the full force of the law. Basque has won a major battle to ease the impact of the debanking scandal on hunting and shooting. The Financial Conduct Authority has confirmed it will consider Basque's evidence into unexplained and widespread withdrawal of banking services for hunts, shooting clubs and businesses linked to the hunting sector. Basque says it deals with dozens of cases every week where people are refused banking service or even asked to close their account. And it's, it's all types of business, it's farm, farming as well. Um, why, why, why would that happen to you? you know, and it's, it's devastating for the people who've been affected and I've dealt with lots of case studies over the years and we've had a flurry of new ones come in on the back of, of the, the publicity around this. Um, devastating to be just get a phone call or go into your bank and suddenly be told we're shutting you down and, and people aren't even getting 30 days notice or 60 days notice. It's literally this is happening. A farmer who runs a zoo in Cambridgeshire and legally feeds deer his shot to his lions is the victim of animal rights protests. Andy Johnson rescues wildlife and has recently taken on one male and one female lion at the Oldhurst Zoo in Huntingdon. He recently told the BBC he feeds deer he's legally shot on local farmland to the two lions to supplement their diet. Since the report appeared, Andy has had visits to his farm from animal rights activists and online abuse. Andy rescues and rehomes animals including lions, crocodiles and alligators at the venue in Cambridgeshire. Two historic Scottish estates have won awards to recognise their work in wildlife management and conservation. The European Commission recognised work carried out on the Glen Rinnes estate, which farms on 6,000 acres of land between the Highlands and the River Spey. The Torwood Lee estate in the Scottish Borders also won accreditation for its work in forestry, shooting and deer management and to reintroduce black grouse to their land. An angler has landed a £100 catfish from a lake in Oxfordshire. Richard Cook hooked the giant catfish from the linear fishery to claim the lake record. The huge fish was landed after an epic fight lasting more than half an hour. It weighed an astonishing 112 pounds. He returned it to fight another day. Environment Minister Trey's Coffey is being criticised for being complacent because the government is failing to meet water quality standards. Lord Clive Hollock, Chairman of Water Industry Regulatory Committee, says there's deep-rooted complacency over the failure to successfully deliver its plan for water. DEFRA introduced the policy to clean up sewage from waterways, ban wet wipes containing plastics and reduce storm overflow discharges. Peers have written to the Environment Minister saying there's too much of a delay in making things happen, which is hugely damaging to the environment. DEFRA says it disagrees with the findings of the committee. A new kind of immigrant is dominating the home of the US president. While Joe Biden wrestles with problems including Mexican immigration and whether or not he will be impeached, Canada geese have landed on the succulent grass around the White House in Washington DC and are busy eating it. Joe doesn't want to shoot them, but White House staff reckon they have found a solution. They are removing the food source. They are mowing their way out of the problem. And finally, a couple of weeks ago, we told you about a mysterious seeker that had been shot in Scotland. 
This video taken by the hunter showed a deer which appeared to have both female and male parts. The British Deer Society have now examined the footage and have solved the mystery. BDS scientists say it's not that unusual for male seeker to have large nipples like a female. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, Meredith, who would love it if you clicked like below this film on YouTube. Thank you. We have another Field Sports Live coming up. If you can be in Cannock in Staffordshire on Friday the 6th of October 2023, it's Shooting Sports UK and there's a link to it below. It's our stage show. It goes behind the scenes of Field Sports Channel and thanks to Dan Bibb at Shooting Sports UK for fixing it. Now, our own Deborah Hadfield went to Ian Hodge Field Sports in Cornwall last week for her own nefarious purposes. In the Cornish okay, countryside, so Field Sports okay. yep. meets feature okay, filmmaking. Yeah. At an open day to celebrate the extension to Ian Hodge's shop, my film crew came along too. Many of you will know me as a news correspondent for Field Sports Channel, but I'm also a film director. We will be shooting a scene of my new feature film in the autumn. We're actually at the Ian Hodge Field Sports Open Day near Wade Bridge in Cornwall. And what's great about this is it's giving us the opportunity to actually see the clay pigeon shoot in action, which is wonderful because it means that we can be safe and authentic, particularly because we're working with Field Sports Channel TV. We want to make sure everything in the movie does actually show real life. Although there'll be a bit of movie magic, there always is, there was a bit of cheating. What we show on screen needs to be very, very safe, very fun. We want to make it entertaining for the people of Cornwall too. When you first asked, can you come here and film, I, I said, yeah, because I, I just, I love the making of films anyway, just as a, how they can do it and make things seem real when they're not real. So to have a film actually partly being filmed here was, uh, well, interesting from my point of view and, and pretty exciting as well. Whether I'm going to be the star, I'm not, I don't think so, but there could be a grumpy old man walking in the background. It wasn't all about the costumes, the scenery, the makeup, the props. The open day was all about shooting and it attracted suppliers. Well, it's been really good, yeah, people are interested. A lot of existing users having a look, asking us questions, uh, bringing their own products to check and say, what, is this right? How does this work? Can you talk me how to use this product? Also, what have you got coming out? We can't say too much, but in the next couple of months, you'll see a few products that will really shake up the industry in terms of performance, price point, and completely new products that people haven't seen before. So we are excited about that. Devon and Cornwall Police attended to help with variations. Devon and Cornwall Firearms Licensing has been the subject of Field Sports news feature after news feature in the last couple of years. Is it now providing a good service? Fortunately, the police have been listening to us with the help of Field Sports Channel and certain gun shops we, and the Gun Trade Association. We managed to galvanise Devon and Cornwall Police and they are helping us quite a bit now. They phoned up, asked if they, would, if they could come to uh, the open day. I was delighted that, that they have agreed to come and said they would. And they're doing variations or they've done variations. You had a, a month to apply up to two days ago and we've had a lot of people do variations and, and, and coming in purchasing guns, which is what it's all about and what we need. Back to the glamour of the movies. Ian and his team have agreed to help me with my feature film. Seven strangers searching for faith, hope, love and chocolate as a Cornish support group. I'd say the movie marriage is Love Actually meets Bridget Jones' Diary, because they're the two films which have really inspired me. Although actually the reason I've decided to set it at Christmas because most of my favourite films, including A Wonderful Life, I Love Actually, About Time, often they have a Christmas festive element. I think there's something about Christmas that brings out the joy uh, and the fun in life, really. It gives an excuse to celebrate being alive. And I think also on the back of the DVD, I'd be saying, this is my love letter to Cornwall and also to the Cornish people that are making us so welcome. Cornwall has been the star of many films and programmes over the years and it seems to be getting better and better. Cornwall is such a beautiful place with the, not just the beaches, you've got the beaches, the moors, the open fields, the green fields, country lanes and fantastic gun shop. For more about Ian Hodge, go to ianhodgefieldsports.co.uk and to find out about my film, visit queenbeefilms.com.
Thanks all who took part in that. Next, Andy Ford covers the Orvis Saltwater Fly Fishing Festival on the south coast of England. Welcome to the fourth Orvis Saltwater Fly Fishing Festival here in the incredible waters around Chichester Harbour. From humble beginnings, this event has grown and has now become the biggest of its kind anywhere in the world. The festival held here in Chichester Harbour began four years ago as the Covid lockdown eased and competitive angling was allowed to return. It's absolutely fantastic. This is our fourth, uh, fourth festival, uh, biggest one we've ever done. Um, it's really great to be able to welcome 180 anglers to, to the Orvis Saltwater Fly Fishing Festival this year. The 180 anglers taking part this year fish for three days, searching the coastline for saltwater species, including bass and mullet. So why has this event grown to become such a fantastic thing? I think part of the reason, just have a little look around, this place is extraordinary, isn't it? We're at Church Norton, which has become almost the traditional place for the event to start every single year but actually what's happened this year is because the competition has grown so much the fishing grounds have expanded we've gone as far to the east of the region as we can to Bognor Regis but the competition grounds have expanded into Portsmouth they've gone a long way further west and actually we've got more water than we've ever fished before and there are more anglers taking part so it just goes to show that saltwater fly fishing is really on the rise. While this event is a competition it's also about the friendships that emerge from a large group of like-minded people enjoying time together doing what they love. Lots of notes are compared, frustrations shared about the one that got away or in the case of mullet fishing, the one that was seen but never hooked in the first place. It's just as much about being out in the fresh air and enjoying it and being around uh, other anglers. Everyone's so, uh, so friendly, we all chat and pass, uh, pass notes on to each other. Headed off early just trying to figure out where I should go. That was a challenging one. Um, but um, yeah, no, it's really, really good. Last night I had a beer, had a catch up with a few people trying to get an idea of where to go next. Um, and everyone's been really helpful, uh, helped me out with the, the wind direction so I knew which way I should be kind of aiming towards which part of the island should it be safe to head out to. But yeah, spot on, really good. This is the second event for me. I did the last year's saltwater fly fishing event uh, and I was so pleased to catch a fish, as, as small as it was, but I did catch a, a brace of small fish over at, uh, at Thorny Island. So uh, yeah, so that was the reason why I come back this time round. In fact, people keep coming back to chase their saltwater fly fishing dreams in this most wonderful environment. Because it's a festival and not an out and out competition, there's always help at hand. The festival begins on a Friday with discussions on how to fish using fly tactics in salt water. There are several masterclasses too. One of the biggest challenges when casting flies at fish in saltwater environments is dealing with coastal breezes. Casting expert Charles Jardine has made it his mission to try and help people deal with whatever they face with a fly rod in hand. It doesn't matter who you are, me, anyone, at whatever stage of development you are, I think we can always appreciate for, for a pair of eyes that actually can just assimilate or, or take in what you're doing and then just try and alter things, just tiny little things that make, might make a difference. This is a catch and release competition, so everything that's landed goes safely back into the water. But before you catch them, you've got to work out how to hook and land them. Which brings us to mullet fishing. They're the most frustrating yet satisfying quarry to pursue. A fish you can see but so often can't catch. The ultimate challenge for a fly angler. Fishing for them using fly tactics has been pioneered by Colin McLeod. He was also on hand to help deal with a million questions about the enigma that is mullet fishing. Mullet are my speciality um, and there were very few mullet fishers when, when I first began and there's, there's very few mullet guides around even, even today. So I've had, you know, I've had quite a few requests to help people. It's great to have the chance to pass on some of your experience to, to help people along their, their own personal journey. But I really enjoy the social side of things as well. And, 
having a chance to interact with fellow anglers. And, uh, and it's not just about fishing, you know, our, our conversations are, are quite wide ranging and go well beyond, beyond fishing. With the expansion in the fishing grounds for the Saltwater Festival, different sorts of venues have now been opened up. I can't begin to tell you just how different they are. This tidal channel may not look like a classic fly fishing destination. In fact, it certainly isn't. But it circles Portsmouth and is often full of fish, including bass and mullet. It's areas like these which have opened up to give the saltwater fly anglers more opportunities to pursue their target throughout the festival. But how about the fishing itself? Over the course of the event there were plenty of bass caught, both big and small. This fish, landed by Steve Laws, measured 59 centimetres. All the fish in the competition are measured in centimetres before being returned. Amazingly, one of an identical size was caught by his fishing pal Ben Worley two hours later. They would go on to share the bass prize. Gentlemen, the 59 centimetre club, how's that? Well done, Steve. It's a great feeling. Wonderful fish. Gave us both a really good fight, both fish, didn't they? They did, yeah. And we're chuffed to bits. It's a great start to the weekend. So just get pencil picture, Ben. How, how far apart were these two fish in terms of time? Uh, I think about two, three hours, two and a half, three hours. Yeah, so I think Steve had his slack tide, high slack tide, and then uh, mine was about two, three hours later, just as it was starting to move back out. Um, completely out of the blue. Same size, which is unreal, really. There were also quite a few mullet caught. This one was landed by David Bazin, a thick lip mullet measuring 50 centimetres. Lewis Clark landed this fish, carried safely in his landing net to where he measured it at 56 centimetres. But the biggest fish of the weekend was landed by local angler Matt Fender. Went down this morning, uh, very muddy mark. Um, saw a few fish, didn't see a lot of really hard feeding fish, but um, covered them anyway. And you know, I was lucky enough to get get an eat, and there it was. Yeah, it went off like a train, and ten minutes of absolute mayhem, um, heart and mouth stuff. Got it in the net, and yeah, couldn't be happier. And happiness seems to be the key to the success of the Orvis Saltwater Fly Fishing Festival. <laughs>Thank you all who came along to that. Now from fish to left-handed guns, Robin Shedden from Clooney Country says what to look at. Robin, you just had some left-handers in the shop and you've been selling them a shotgun. Now, is it as simple as I want a left-handed shotgun, I want a right-handed shotgun? Just tell me a little bit more about the complexities of the left-handed shooter, what's available to them. Left-handed shooters get folk in here all the time saying they want a left-handed shotgun. Left-handed is the twisting of the stock to fit in your shoulder bending that way as compared to your shoulder bending this way. So the stock is cut to suit and therefore more comfortable. It is bent to suit so that if you're right-handed you're looking up at if you're left-handed it's bent the other way so that your eye, the eye looking along the rib of the shotgun is dead in line and the gun is shooting where you look. Unfortunately, it's much more complicated than that. That's, that's the really simple bit. The critical bit is where your eye is. Do you have a left master eye or a right master eye? The, the critical bit is that the master eye is the one that's looking at the shotgun. Come on to that in a minute. The halfway mark is what all the manufacturers do. Beretta and Blazer on the F-16s take a right-handed action and put a left-handed stock on it. So it still opens as a right-hander would, which is the wrong way for a left-hander. Browning have come out this year, I think it came out at the start of last year, with true left hand, whereby the gun, because when I pick it up, it doesn't open, you push it the other way. So actually, it's for a left-hander. If you're a left-hander, it's opening in the natural direction. The stock is cast for a left-hander, and the top lever opens for a left-hander. Great. Blazer do that as well with their F3s, but you're on a totally different price point. It then is a proper left-handed shotgun for use by a left-handed person. 
Returning to my pet subject, because it just isn't as simple as that, it's the master eye that counts. The bit that's absolutely critical is that the eye that is feeding the brain is the one that's looking down the shotgun. If you get a left-hander who comes in, as I do all the time, and they say, I want a left-handed shotgun, yep, I'm left-handed, super, but they've got a right master eye, the whole job does not work because the shotgun is coming over here, but it's this eye that's looking at it. Therefore, the shotgun does not point where the shooter thinks, doesn't shoot where he's going to. That person either needs to take away the vision from the right eye, which immediately makes the left eye into the dominant eye, or shoot off the right shoulder, even though they're left-handed. It's really, it's not as simple as I'm left-handed, so I need a left-handed shotgun. The eye matters and the vision that's being fed into the brain, that's the critical bit, not which hand. You can teach yourself to shoot the other way, as we all did when I was on an instructor's course a million years ago, and you get used to it. If you want to shoot off your left shoulder with a right master eye, you must take away the vision of your right eye. Wear a patch, put smearing on your glasses, put a bit over the end of the barrel. I've seen it whereby the right eye can't see the end of the barrel. There are plenty of ways of doing it. Come in, come in and see it, or go to any quality gunsmith, but come in and we can sort it all out. The critical bit is the master eye, not the left or right handed. Thanks Robin. Link to the Clooney Guns website below. Now from hardware to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, brought to you by James Marchington, it's Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First this week, here's a film from a French cameraman and sporting journalist, which gives a glimpse of Wayne and David's trip ferreting rabbits in Sweden with Aimpoint. Next up, the Rat Basher is back with another farmyard ratting video, narrated in the style of Johnny Morris, for those old enough to remember his 1970s TV series Animal Magic. Meanwhile in the States, the high prairie sportsmen Matt and Bryce are decoying teal, and find that coot decoys mixed in with the pattern make it much more attractive to the ducks. Staying with duck hunting, Ramsey Russell heads to Peru for a very different type of wildfowling on a lake 16,000 feet up in the Andes Mountains. The Fowl Mitten Channel are decoying geese at normal altitudes, using layout blinds on stubble, until a furious ante shows up, blasting her horn to scare the birds, and the police are called. Here's another hunt interrupted. Chris Waters and friends are after a big red stag in Australia. They spook a herd of water buffalo, which stampede straight through the ground they were about to stalk. With night vision and thermal dominating the world of predator control, the night crew channel are going against the grain, using powerful white lights to shoot coyotes after dark. There's no denying their success, and all that light makes for some stunning footage too. Finally this week, the Triple C Odyssey channel looks at the tragic aftermath of the 1977 hunting ban in Kenya. It's hard to believe that nearly half a century later, some people still think banning hunting will help wildlife. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top 8, email charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain, it's about 7pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye.